In this final talk on the theme of discipleship, what we see in chapters 13 to 16 is the confrontation that the disciples have with their fears. Fear is a motif that we see throughout these chapters. And the way that they deal with their fears and encounter, when they encounter that which they fear, is not uniformly flattering. But part of why Mark recorded all of this for us is that his audience knew that all of them eventually overcame their fears in order to carry forward the faith that Jesus had given to them. And so for his audience, who we may recall were Roman Gentile Christians dealing with the situation where many of the Jewish Christians had been expelled from Rome and felt somewhat cast adrift, they were very much experiencing being afraid. Mark, by describing in detail the encounter between the various disciples and their fears, gives his audience the opportunity to see that there's a way past whatever it is that's causing them terror. Chapter 13, verse 11, Jesus instructs us to say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. That is, we should not fear to say the right thing, provided we're being open to the voice of the Spirit. Alas, this was not easy for the disciples to accept as the passion unfolded. Chapter 14, verses um, 27 through 31, Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him three times. Peter... Uh, claims that he will die rather than deny him, and everyone else says the same thing. Now, when the arrest comes in 14, chapter 14, verse 50, they all deserted him and fled. Not a lot of time elapsed from promising to die with him to run in fear. On one level, it might be easy to make fun of them, but on another level, I think we can all readily identify with them. The scene in the garden with swords and clubs is terrifying. It must have been confusing, frightening, the mob, nighttime, not knowing what's going on, and in the moment, what does one do? One runs away. What could they have done? Well, they promised they would die with him. They would remain in his company. They would remain with him. In a way, in Gethsemane, he was trying to prepare them for this. Remain with me while I pray. Why? So they could remain with him in his passion. But they deserted him and fled. Peter followed at a distance. One of the maids came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. Why would he have said that? He was afraid. He didn't want to be arrested. If I look at the interior of my own soul, if I were there, I would have felt the same temptation. Would I have done the same thing? I don't know. I would pray that I would do better than Peter, but you never really know till it happens. 
And the maids saw him and began to, again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while again, the bystanders said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. One of the other Gospels will make reference to the fact that they picked it up from his accent. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. So that's what Peter's fear had taken him to. Simon of Cyrene, chapter 15, verse 21. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. What must Simon have experienced in that moment? Fear, fear of what they would do to him if he didn't agree to carry the cross. Fear of what it would mean to be associated with him carrying the cross. But we see an indication of something important, something special here. He's introduced as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, me, sitting here in the 21st century, I have no idea who Alexander and Rufus are, and I have no particular reason to care. But the audience for whom he was writing must have absolutely known who Alexander and Rufus were. They must have themselves become disciples of Jesus after his resurrection. They were no doubt among the group that Peter brought with him to Rome. And, equally no doubt, they were probably brought there by their father. Who after literally taking up Jesus' cross and following him, later in turn took up the metaphorical cross and followed him. So that was Simon of Cyrene's passage from fear to faith. What of the women? The women were there looking on from afar, it says. Why from afar? Because they were afraid, quite reasonably. But they didn't give up on what they perceived to be their responsibilities. When Jesus was buried, they followed to the tomb so they could see where he was buried so that they could do the proper anointings after the Sabbath had passed. And when it was passed, they in fact returned. They brought spices so they could go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, there they were. Let's listen to this unfold. Very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is actually kind of a terrifying passage when you think about it. They were so overwhelmed with what had happened that what Mark is telling us here is they didn't go tell, they didn't remind the disciples to go to Galilee to see Jesus. 
So Mark kind of leaves us hanging for a moment. What happened? Now here's the really stunning part. The oldest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark actually end at this verse. Verses 9 to 20 were added later on. So this is actually Mark's original intended ending. Verses 9 to 20 are a summary of the appearances of Jesus in the other Gospels. So the appearance to Mary Magdalene, that comes from John, for instance. The appearance to the two, that's the road to Emmaus from Luke. The ascension scene, that's from Matthew, and so forth. So Mark kind of weirdly leaves us hanging. But to understand why he leaves us hanging, we have to pay attention to another odd little detail. That's in chapter 14, verses 51 and 52. A little passage that's easy to overlook and forget, but which I'm convinced is one of the most important passages in the entire gospel. This is after the arrest. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This guy has not been introduced prior, and he's not mentioned again. It is widely believed by many commentators that this young man is Mark, the author of the gospel in that scene. And why would he include that scene? He was afraid. In that moment, Mark himself was filled with fear. The tradition of the church says that Mark was a young member of the family that hosted Jesus and his disciples for the Last Supper. And in that sense, was uh, present, present among them as one of the hosts, part of the family of the host. And of course, given that they were hosting this, that family was a family that was sympathetic to Jesus and his cause. And Mark, as well, followed Jesus from the example of his family. When Jesus was arrested, he actually continued to follow him for a moment until they seized him. Then he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. It's almost kind of a tongue-in-cheek. I, the author, put up with that level of embarrassment to avoid getting arrested. Mark then, by including this reference to himself, helps us to understand the ending of the gospel. The audience knows that they all ultimately saw the risen Christ. After all, think back to the transfiguration. They could not have spoken of the transfiguration. They promised to wait until after he had risen from the dead. They did indeed talk about it. They saw him, ultimately. But Mark is wanting to do two things here. First, he is affirming his audience's feelings of desolation at the moment of composition of the gospel. Peter had been banished from Rome. How they were going to carry on was not clear in the context of the time. But Mark then also gives them the reassurance that that fear is something that even those who had been the strongest witnesses to Jesus had experienced. And by ending the gospel there, he gives them the opportunity to walk with the disciples in that moment of fear and to experience those moments of fear 
with them, knowing that they ultimately overcame it. Mark himself, then, is the ultimate example of this. He fled naked in fear, and now he was among Peter's followers who came to Rome, and he was there and ready to bear witness by writing this gospel and distributing it. So in that way, Mark brings consolation to all of us who, through fear in one way or another, fall short in their witness. It's worth contemplating then our own fears that compromise us. If I examine my own conscience and my own soul, what would be things I'm afraid of? I've got a big family. I've got five kids to feed. I fear the loss of resources, job, career, what have you. Let's be blunt. I fear physical suffering. I would have as much fear as the disciples did in 13 to 16 if I were there. So how do we move from fear to faith? The number one answer is keep your eye on the prize. And the number one way to do that is constant prayer. Why? Because when we pray, we invite Jesus into our lives in whatever moments we're experiencing, with whatever suffering we may be experiencing, even with the joys that we're experiencing. We invite Jesus to be there with us. And why do we invite him to be there with us? Because ultimately, we hope to be with him for eternity. So we build the habit of inviting him to be with us in all of those moments that we experience, good and bad. The practice of daily prayer keeps our eyes on the prize. And if our eyes are focused on the prize, we can get past our fears of the other things that clamor for our attention, the anxieties that seek to tear us away from the call to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. Ultimately, the gospel does have a happy ending, and the biggest clue is tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Although 16.8 seems ambiguous, we know in the end that they did see the risen Jesus after it all. And by affirming once again that he is Peter and no longer Simon, we see Peter once again being brought back into his position of being the rock upon whom the church is built. So um, I've got a couple of questions for reflection there that I invite you to take with you. I'm going to take a few moments now to kind of contemplate and summarize everything that we've studied and learned over the last month in our exploration of the Gospel of Mark. So this was probably the first gospel written and we see the word gospel from the very opening line, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The three major themes of the gospel of Mark are the person of Jesus, the kingdom of God, and discipleship. When contemplating the person of Jesus, Mark reveals for us Jesus in the fullness of both his humanity and his divinity. 
as the true Messiah come for the sake of the world. We see him suffer in his humanity in Gethsemane and frankly at moments just running out of patience with his disciples. We see him in his divinity proclaiming his messiahship and bringing the good news of salvation and eternal life. The kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom. It's a heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of God is not always visible in an earthly sense. It's often hidden like the mustard seed. But the good that it brings about is immeasurable. All are invited to be part of the kingdom of God. Jews, Gentiles, everyone is called to the kingdom. The kingdom exists provisionally on earth, subsisting within the Catholic Church. Through the sacraments of the Catholic Church, the kingdom is perpetuated. Through baptism, our original sin and other uh, actual sin are washed away. Through the Eucharist, we take part in Jesus' ultimate self-offering sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on behalf of all of us. His blood, the new covenant. Through holy orders, apostolic succession, Jesus appoints deputies, delegates, to carry forth his ministry of repentance of sin, casting out devils, and bringing about healing, anointing of the sick. And ultimately, the kingdom of God will be fully realized in the creation of a new heaven and a new earth at the end of the age when Jesus returns. Mark then outlines discipleship. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? He makes clear that it is not an easy path. We need to take up our crosses and follow him. We need to be careful to leave behind anything that keeps us from following him. And what are some of those things? It could be wealth. It could be an unwillingness to forgive. It could be persistence in sin. We need to amputate whatever sins are holding us back and make use of the blessing of the confessional to assist us to that end. The prize then for discipleship is eternal life. But... It comes at a cost. And that cost is we have to follow Jesus to his death in order to experience his resurrection. But to that end, we are given immensely powerful spiritual tools in order to achieve this. The devotional tradition of the church, the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the divine mercy chaplet, the way of the cross. We're given all we need. Most of all, our study of the Gospel of Mark has been an opportunity for each of us to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Mark wrote his Gospel in order to address a specific concrete situation. He may not have envisioned that we would still be reading it 20 centuries later. But God's plans are always greater than ours, and the growing of the mustard seed is not always ours to behold. I hope then that these four sessions have been as much of a blessing for you as they have been for me, as I have learned so much as well from my own study and preparation uh, for these talks. Looking ahead to the future, I am certainly hoping uh, not to stop here. We've, we've got some more Gospels to look at, I would say, in the months and years to come. And I'll look forward to discussing some of those possibilities with you all as well when the time comes. 
Let's close our sessions in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of the Gospel of Mark, preserved over 20 centuries, so that we may have the opportunity to grow ever closer to you. We pray that this experience of exploring the Gospel of Mark may bear fruit for all of us here in ways that we may or may not even anticipate, but in ways that ultimately build up the kingdom and invite ever more disciples to follow you faithfully. St. Mark, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.